Dr. Anthony Orsini is a practicing neonatologist who took what he learned over 25 years of experience delivering tragic news to patients and their families and founded The Orsini Way, a communications training company that helps healthcare professionals and business leaders build strong relationships and navigate through the most difficult conversations. And this is exactly what we discuss. He teaches us his strategy for having those difficult conversations, how and why to have a plan, what nonverbal cues to be cognizant of, and he takes us through his acronym, PROGRAM, to help us remember the steps. We also talk about his business and some lessons he learned in the running of it. He recently published a book titled, It's All in the Delivery, Improving Healthcare, Starting with a Single Conversation, and he has his own podcast, Difficult Conversations, Lessons I Learned as an ICU Physician and is a frequent speaker at medical and business conferences on the topic of compassionate communication. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee, and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Before we get into the show, here's a quick message from MR Insurance, a small business that helps physicians with their disability insurance needs. Michael L. Relvis is a CFP professional and insurance agent committed to helping physicians nationwide with their term life and disability insurance needs. He provides an objective, transparent, and education-focused process that aims to help physicians make prudent decisions and avoid overcomplicating things. He exclusively offers own occupation disability insurance policies for residents, fellows, and attending physicians. We really like Michael and know he's got your best interest at heart when it comes to disability insurance. We know he'd be happy to help you with whatever your needs are. You can find Michael at drpodcastnetwork.com slash mrinsurance or contact him at 800-817-4522. That's 800-817-4522. Dr. Anthony Orsini, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a real honor. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited too. So what compelled you to develop the Orsini way? Well, you know, everyone asks me that, uh, well, how I got really interested in communication in general, and specifically how I started off teaching doctors how to break bad news. It was a story that I talk about in my book. Uh, when I was a neonatal fellow, I was really very, uh, very privileged. I had both my parents. I was very fortunate. I had a nice, nice, healthy baby. I had five grandparents, so I never really experienced any tragedy. And so as I became a neonatal fellow... I knew that I was going to have to give really bad news a lot of times, unfortunately. And so it really scared me to death. So I remember one time I was a first year fellow that really changed me. I had to go pick up a baby uh, across the bridge from Philadelphia to New Jersey. Baby had meconium aspiration syndrome and was really, really, very sick pulmonary hypertension. I went to go pick him up um, and the baby started coding on the way home back to the hospital. We got to the hospital my senior physician that was on call with me in those days, when you were a first year fellow, you had an attending on call with you. And then after that, you were by yourself. Uh, but he was on with me that day. And we coded the baby and the baby unfortunately passed away. The attending that I was on that night was, and still is probably my favorite doctor ever. He was super compassionate, brilliant, um, treated me like a son. I, I just really looked up to him. And just as the baby died, the charge nurse came in and said the father had followed the ambulance, and he was waiting for us in the waiting room. And so uh, I said, we'll call him Dr. Smith because I don't use his real name. So I said to Dr. Smith, can I come with you to see how you tell that mother, the father, how, how his baby died? And he said, sure. And so we went down the hallway. He knocked on the door, opened the door. And I still say I can't explain what happened then, but this kind, compassionate man, someone that I really looked up to, he opened up the door. He found the father was pacing back and forth naturally. And he just opened the door and he said, my name's Dr. Smith and your baby's dead. And I, I was like, what just happened? And the father got so angry. He knocked down the table lamp. He put his fist through the wall. And I went to go do something because Dr. Smith just stood there. And he, he stopped me and he said, just let him be. And so the father calmed down. Then the true compassionate Dr. Smith came out and he spoke to the father nicely. We brought the father to see his baby. 
we spent a little time with him and then we walked down the hallway. When I got out into the hallway, Dr. Smith was waiting for me and he grabbed me by my scrubs. He pulled me in really close within maybe, Brad, maybe a foot from his face. And he looked at me and he was crying. And he said to me really firmly, he said, do you see what I just did? Don't ever do that. And then he walked down the hallway onto the fire escape and he cried for like 20 minutes. And to be perfectly honest with you, that changed me. I thought, if this kind, compassionate, brilliant, intelligent man doesn't know how to do this, then what chance do I have? And so I started to um, be really interested on how physicians communicate and what makes one physician better at breaking bad news than others. I spent the next 10 years of my career trying to figure it out. And there was very little literature on it at the time. We're talking in the mid nineties. And so I really started to interview patients and families and almost 200 patients and families and said, what, what was it that you remember about the doctor? What was it that he or she did well? And after 10 years of research came up and found out that there really was a right way to break bad news and, and a wrong way and came up with the acronym program, which we could talk about later on. And in 2010, I started teaching residents using improvisational role-playing with professional actors uh, how to break bad news. And it, it caught on. I gave a grand rounds. The next thing you know, I was being asked to give grand rounds all over the country. The news got, uh, got really hold of it. And this thing just caught on. And so it started out as really a way of teaching young residents how to break bad news. But it turned out to be a way of teaching senior doctors, maternal fetal medicine people, cancer doctors, oncologists. Uh, and it just took off. Uh, we started out as a uh, really a 501c3 way back in 2010. That didn't work out. So I started the Orsini Way. And uh, now the Orsini Way does all kinds of communication training, not only breaking bad news, but uh, how to deliver uh, good news and how to have build rapport and build relationships and so uh, that's the long story, I guess, of how I started to become really interested and fascinated with communication and then decided that, you know, Brad, it's, it's like this. It's when I felt like I had a secret and I wanted to get on the top of a mountain and tell everybody, listen, I found the secret on how to form relationships with patients. I found the secret on how to speak compassionately. I found the secret on how you can get great patient satisfaction scores how to build these relationships both at home and and in the in the hospital. And so uh, the Orsini way was a way of me uh, utilizing that and getting the word out and and uh, just teaching what I love to teach. That's great. That's and that's the whole idea behind what we do here at the podcast, right? Like all those things that we should be teaching and learning in medical school but aren't, right? But I guess we are now. Um, they are now because of people like you, right? Like you've developed this technique and now now you're passing it on to your residents and they're going to pass it on to their residents where they're going to pass it on to their residents. So it really, uh, it really perpetuates. So, and it's, you no, know, in my experience, it's, it's so critical, sometimes even more critical than knowing the medicine. Because if Absolutely. you can't develop that relationship, if you can't dis- establish that relationship, you might not end up getting information that you otherwise would if there was more of a level of trust. And then to get the patient to do what you want them to do, there needs to be this level of trust. And, and if you're not communicating well, then those two things might not happen or one of them happens and then the other one doesn't. So, And it doesn't, it, it doesn't come naturally to everyone. In fact, most people are not good communicators, but can learn. And, you know, in the tens of thousands of doctors that I have trained how to break bad news, but also how to build rapport and get their patient satisfaction scores up. Most of the doctors really want to get better. They want, you know, they don't understand why is it that I'm I'm not getting good scores and other doctors are. I'm a good doctor and so is he or she. Uh, and it really is very satisfying when you teach them these very specific communication techniques and they email me back or call me back and say, oh my God, I changed one word. And all of a sudden, I got a smile out of my patient. I, you know, I, I changed one word and my patient all of a sudden gave me great scores or is now sending me to all his family. And, and that's what it's all about. And it's teachable. It's teachable. It's a lot of stuff that you would think is innate, but it's teachable. 
Like you can teach someone how to be funny. You can teach them how to how to break bad news. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. Maybe we're going off script here, but I'll give you an ex example of something that we learned. So when I interviewed all, all the, we did an, a survey and I interviewed hundreds of patients. And one of the questions I asked them, I said, what makes you feel more comfortable? A doctor who comes in and says, hi, I'm Dr. Orsini. I'm one of the pediatricians here. Or another person that comes in and says, hi, I'm Dr. Orsini. I'm the resident in charge of your child today. And 60% of them, Brad, said they'd rather have the resident. And I said, you know a resident doesn't know anything, right? And, and they said, yes, but that's my resident. And so when I, when I say that to other doctors, they go, wow, I never thought about that because for 25 years, I've been saying I'm one of the ENT. I'm one of the surgeons. I'm one of the hospitalists. And they come back to me and they go, wow, I, I say that now. And all of a sudden I get this different look on my patient's face. And, you know, it's about ownership. Because when you say I'm one of, the, the, what the patients told me is you're just, you don't want to take responsibility. You know, if anything goes wrong, I'm just one of the docs, so don't blame me. Which is interesting because as doctors, we would never think that. It's also interesting because my practice is almost entirely outpatient. And your practice is entirely inpatient. If yes. they're an outpatient, they, they don't need you anymore, right? Uh, you've done your job. They're out of the hospital. So, um, so you know, in, in my situation, I would never introduce myself that way. It, you know, it comes off as, as, you know, I'm the doctor in charge of your care because they made an appointment to see me. Right. But one of the assumptions that I made in the past that was incorrect is I assumed they knew who I was because they made the appointment to see me, right? They made the appointment. That's not necessarily true. Maybe yeah. their family member made the appointment. Maybe their pediatrician made the appointment. It might not have been them that made the appointment. And even if they did, they might've made it a while ago and they don't know who the heck you are. So you definitely have to introduce yourself and you definitely have to make it clear who you are and what you do. So, you know, even when it's not, if it, on an inpatient setting, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm the doctor in charge of your care, you know, definitely say who you are, but you can even, even the medical student, it's going to be very empowering. Hi, I'm the medical student who's going to be, in, well, maybe not in charge because that's a little bit of an overstep, <laughs> we'll but- I'm the yeah. medical student who will be helping caring for your baby. I'm yeah. the medical student who's helping Dr. Orsini. Um, it, it's such a small thing, and yet most of us don't even think about it. You yeah. know, especially if you're inpatient hospitalist. You know, I'm one of the cardiologists, and I'm here to do a consult. Well, I don't want one of the cardiologists. I want the cardiologist. Medicine is a a human to human interaction between two people. And I think what's going on is that we're forgetting that. And that that's part of what I teach at the Orsini Way. And it's so easy because you do it all the time, multiple times a day. So just, you know, develop your shtick. Like you figure out what you want in your introduction to be, but make sure it's like this ownership type language that's going to uh, endear the patient to you and help them to trust you. So figure, figure out how you want your introduction to be. And then you just have to say it the same way every time. So, yeah, I think that's that's a great and, and we get caught up and we get caught up in being task oriented. It happens to all of us. It happens to me, I'm sure it happens to you where you you get in a rush and you've developed that shtick as you say or you've developed this personality that works and maybe you go into the next office and you rush through it. It's going to happen to you, but once you start understanding what's important for communication, you'll find yourself catching yourself. You know, like, oh, I rushed through that one. That wasn't good. You're human. I'm human. It's going to happen. But understanding what the difference is between a good interaction and a bad interaction, you'll catch yourself the next time. Yeah. And you'll improve. It's, uh, you know, I, th I think of it like a, like a stand-up comedian who they've got their shtick. And you know what? They tried something. It didn't work. The audience didn't like it. They didn't go for it. So the next time they deliver it a little differently, they try it again, you know, and, and it evolves it evolves over time. Certainly it's not going to be the same with each audience. You have to react. Um, but, but certainly the introduction, you know, you can always start, start in a similar way. So, so let's go through what you discussed earlier program, right? Your book, it's all in the delivery. You discuss this acronym, but I know you don't like referring it to it as an acronym. It's more of a like guidelines a program. So can you walk us through what each letter stands for and and where it takes us for, for breaking bad news. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, and I, the word I use is roadmap. It's a roadmap for you to remember. I, I tell the doctors that I that I train, I don't want your eyes to roll up and say, okay, what's the next letter? Because it doesn't come off too genuine that way. Uh, yeah, the, pro, the program uh, roadmap uh, started out as a way of teaching bad news. But then as years uh, went by, I started to realize that it's the same communication techniques that will help you in everyday uh, interactions. It's the same communication techniques that help business leaders and HR professionals get along with their employees and be good leaders. Uh, and so that's what we do at the Orsini Way. We use that program acronym for, for everything. And yeah, I'll take you through it. So just briefly, the P stands for plan and position. And uh, it astounds me, especially when you're going to have a serious conversation with a patient, how many physicians that I've trained, well, I'll say, what, what was your plan? And they look at you like, well, I don't really have a plan. I was going to go in there. I was going to tell them they were going to have, they have cancer. But no, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. And positioning yourself, again, whether it's breaking bad news or a, a common interaction, is so important. Sitting down, sitting down, sitting down. I can't emphasize that as, as, as much as I can. You walk around a hospital someday, look around and see how many doctors go into the rooms and don't sit down. When you sit down, the patient perceives, and this is well documented, at least in two studies, a patient perceives that you've spent almost twice as much time in the office with them as if you stood up. So if you sit down for two minutes, they'll think that you sat down for four minutes because the answer that I get when I ask doctors why they don't sit down, they give me two answers. One, I don't have the time, right? And then I say to them, well, okay, look at these two studies I'm going to prove to you. And two, there's no chair. And so... Brad, when I give workshops and I give keynote speaking, I, sometimes I bring a chair on the stage and I say, see this? It moves. <laughs> Chairs actually move. So if there's no chair in the room, the nurse the station is likely 10 feet away. And in fact, if you ha go into a patient's room and say, wait a second, I want to get a chair, they'll appreciate it twice as much. So position yourself understand what body language is, make sure that you're sitting the right way. Although in defense of the residents, I just remember when I was on my transplant rotation as an intern and I had to I had to pre-round on 20 patients all of whom were extremely sick if you sat down that that body language communicated to the patient that you know what you had time but you yeah. didn't because you were there at 4 30 <laughs> in the morning so you had enough time to collect all the it was barely enough time anyway you had gotten home at midnight the night before so sometimes utilizing that body language is is uh, it, it is strategic, but you're you're talking about a more specific situation where you know this is this is going to be something where you really need to communicate that you are giving them as much time as they need. Yeah, and it's sending a message, and, and you'll be surprised. We do this exercise with nurses where we have them go in and sit down and time how long they were in there, and then go in and stand up and sit down. And you'd be surprised just by sitting down, you're likely going to the, the patient might perceive that you you have more time. But that's the whole point, is that they probably won't keep you there longer. Uh, you're right. I mean, residents are a different story. You got 35 patients. You got, but they probably won't keep you longer, but they'll really appreciate the fact that you did. So so then, then review. This first R is review. When you're giving bad news specifically, it's really, really important that you lead up to the bad news. The, the rule of thumb for breaking bad news is the patients that already know that it's coming before you said it. And you use a review. Attorneys, I have attorney friends who tell me in law school, they were taught that you never go in front of your closing argument in front of the jury and you never say, he's guilty and let me tell you why. You say, here's the evidence and that's why you should find them guilty. And that's a really important distinction because once you give bad news or once you tell somebody something profoundly, their job is to convince you that you're wrong. You don't know. So now you're going to spend all your life backtracking the next 20 minutes, no, it is cancer. Well, how do you know it's cancer? Well, I went and I, I, we did the CT scan. We did the biopsy. This is what the, no, start off by, by doing a review. This is what happened. You came to me because you had horses to the throat. You know, when I hear about this, when I, when I see certain things, this is what I worry about. So that's why I sent you just the review. That's why I sent you for the CAT scan. That's why we did the procedure. You know, when I saw that nodule, I was a little worried because it didn't look very regular. So I sent it to the pathologist and I'm glad you brought your husband here today because I wanted to give you the results of the biopsy. You know, it's coming, right? And so that allows, as I say, it allows the patient 
to hold on to the chair a little bit tighter with each with each sentence. And it doesn't have to take long. If you jump to it, it'll look like you didn't care, especially emergency room doctors. Your husband passed away. Well, maybe if you rushed the way you told me, maybe that means that you really didn't do, you didn't really try hard with the resuscitation either. And so show them that all the stuff that you did. Um, so review is really, really important. O stands for observe. And as physicians, we're really, really very trained on observing patients, right? I mean, we're told at medical school, see the way they're standing, see the way they're sitting, but we forget that we're being watched. And, you know, neuroscientists tell us that there's 300 million times per second you are, your brain is making a calculation about my body language. 300 million times per second, it's a fight or flight thing. And so when you walk into a room, you have to remember that patient is watching you. So if you're going to give bad news, you're certainly not going to walk out with a big smile and say, how are you doing today? Because you're sending conflicting messages. How you sit down. If I'm de-escalating a serious conversation, like a conflict resolution, maybe sitting down with my legs crossed and leaning back, that's a casual conversation. I'm going to de-escalate that. If I'm doing a, a genuine, uh, just a routine interaction, and I'm trying to loosen up the patient, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax. But if I sit back, Brad, and I say all the right things, but I'm sitting back in a posture where I'm leaning back with my legs crossed, and then I'm telling you that you have cancer and you're likely going to die, my body language and my verbal language are not consistent. And since you're making 300 million assessments of me per second and 70% of, body, of language is body language, you're going to say, wait a second, he just told me I have cancer, but he's leaning back. That doesn't compute, so he must be full of it or I don't trust him. And it causes anger, distrust every single time. So you want to make sure that if I'm going to give bad news, I'm, a, I'm leaning over on the edge of my seat. I'm talking softly. I'm at the same level. I'm looking at the patient's eyes. I'm not leaning back in a casual conversation. And 300 million times a second, that patient is saying the bad news is coming. And that leads up to the G, which is gradual, which is the number one rule is breaking bad news should always be gradual. You never, never blind somebody. And for the physicians out there who may have been trained a little bit, especially if they're young, there's something called spikes. It's an old acronym that some, uh, some medical stu schools still teach. And Spike says, never always prepare the patient for bad news. But in Spikes, they teach our, our doctors to prepare somebody for bad news by saying, I have bad news. Right? I got to say, no disrespect to Spikes, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. If you're coming in, if someone's coming into your office for the biopsy results and you say, I have bad news, that is the bad news. There's nothing else to say. All of a sudden, fight or flight goes crazy. I start to have palpitations. I'm not hearing anything anymore. I know it's bad news. So we use the old literary rule and say, show, don't tell. So by using your review, by using your body language, you're preparing them for the bad news and not telling them I have bad news. So if anybody out there is doing that, I could just, I, I plead with you, please don't do that anymore. It, it makes people very angry when you do that. And we know that once you give the bad news, only 10% of it is heard. So if you come out and say, I have bad news, they're only going to hear 10% after that. So show, don't tell. And then the second R, uh, and by the way, if we're talking about routine interactions, the G also stands for genuine. You talked about in one of your podcasts about the importance of humor. Be a genuine person. If it's a routine interaction, when I teach patient experience, uh, to hospitals, and it's, it's all in the delivery, the same name as my book. Share something personal with your patients. Tell them that you're a real person. You don't have to give them your social security number, but you can say something to about, it's been a rough day, or, gee, I'm on my fourth day here. I can't wait for a vacation. We're going away. Um, if you're a nurse, my, my five-year-old girl just wouldn't get dressed today for school. It's been, whatever it is, you see a book. I've read that book before. Um, if I see a Yankee hat, you're a Yankee fan. Once you become a real person, you form that instant relationship. And that's that's the second R. It's is R is for relationship. And R is the relationship's the key for everything. Also, if you give a little of yourself, it makes the patient more inclined to give of themselves, right? They're more likely to divulge something and maybe they're going to divulge something that they wouldn't have otherwise done because then you've given a little something of yourself. 
Yeah, it's not just Dr. Orsini. It's it's Dr. Orsini who's originally from New York who who likes the Yankees or, or is a giant fan or likes to go to the beach. All of a sudden now it's two people and that that connection that you make in less than a minute. Yeah. You know, there's there's there was a study, I believe it was out of Gainesville that said uh, you can form a, a relationship in less than 56 seconds if you use the right communication techniques. So R is the relationship and it's the basis of everything we do. It's it's what, to me, what medicine's about. It's, you know, it, listen, anybody can prescribe a medication or do a surgery, no offense. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you can teach that, but it's really, it's, it's about healing and it's about that human connection. And so if you don't know how to form a relationship with a patient, you'll, you'll, never, you'll, you'll never be able to get to a successful practice and, be, and do really be a good, um, a good asset for your patient. And then yeah, the I had a patient last... recently, I had a patient recently mm-hmm. say, because I sent them to someone else, because it's surgery that I, it's like a highly specialized surgery. It's not something I'm comfortable with. So, but they came back and said, are you, are you sure that you can't do it? Because I've, I've got such a, a longstanding relationship, a great relationship with this family. And so even knowing that I, this isn't something that I do, they, they, are you sure? Like, uh, when yeah. would you ever say that to a surgeon? Are you sure you don't want to do this? Yes, yes, I don't want to do this. I'm sending you to someone else. Because it's really all about relationships and trust. Whether it's medicine or business, it's about trust. I, You you probably have the same thing that happened to you all the time. I I get calls from friends and family and they say, you know, my doctor told me to do this, but I was on Google and I read that. Um, You know, what should I do? Should I listen to my doctor or not? And my answer is always the same. Either you trust your doctor or you don't. Yes. Find someone that you trust. If you don't trust him, that's okay. Find somebody that you do, but you can't be your own doctor. Yeah. yeah. And so, I love that. I love that. I love that advice because you're not questioning their Google skills. You're not questioning their wealth of knowledge. What you're doing is you're questioning the relationship and you're not undermining the other doctor because you're not saying anything bad about the other doctor. You're just saying that, listen, there's, there's a reason that you went and Googled this. And the reason is because you don't trust them. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's the same with, with all the anti-vax information going around now. Like that's, that's because they just lack the trust. And isn't it amazing that you're more likely to trust your mechanic? You bring your car in, the guy says, you know, you need a new fan belt. And you say, okay, you don't Google it. <laughs> you don't say, yeah. either you trust the mechanic or you don't. But it's, it's all about trust. And if you are a genuine person and you form that relationship, and to my ER docs out there, ED docs, you can form that relationship very quickly. It doesn't take it doesn't take a family practitioner to know somebody for years by using these certain communication techniques. You can form that relationship, and it really is all about trust. Um, and then the last two letters are uh, A and M. A stands for accountability, and they need to know that you're going to be there if you need me. I'm here. Um, you know, we say things all the time that are are that are very shallow, like. I'll tell somebody profound that they need to go to oncologist or something, something bad. And I'll go, if you need anything, just let me know. Well, to me, that reminds me of what happens. What happens when you call the Apple guy, the Apple tech guy, and he fixes your problem with your Apple? What's the last thing he always says to you? Oh, yeah. Is there anything else I can do for you today? And I'm <laughs> sure they're anything? just praying that you say no. Of so course. The next call. Yeah. I know that he doesn't really want me to say so. Because if you say yes, he goes, oh, Okay. So when we as doctors say, listen, if you need anything, you just call me. That's, that's, that's shallow and they know it. So instead of saying that, say, listen, I'm going to follow up with you or I'll, I'll, to, we're going to make an appointment. We're going to see you again tomorrow. That's the M or meet again. Don't let them know. Don't let them, let them know exactly when they're going to see you again. If you're somebody in a hospital, I'm going to be back and check on you in an hour. I'll, be, I'll, 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 I'll let you uh, sit with your baby for a few minutes and I'll be back in 15 minutes. Let's make an appointment. I know I'm sending you to the oncologist, but let's make an appointment to get together in about a week just to see how you're doing. That makes, uh, it goes a long way to build that relationship. So be accountable. I'm going to help you through this. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be your doctor for a while. And, I, you know, we need to form this mutually trusting relationship. Uh, and so that's the basic program roadmap, if you will. And it works for everything. It even works for business leaders now that are using it. It's been great. What are some of the common mistakes that you see when people are breaking? Let's stick with breaking bad news. Let's, what, are the, what are the common pitfalls you see that we should try to avoid? So I think 
uh, number one is what happens is we tend to rush through it. And it's not, uh, it's, it's not unusual that this happens. And it's really, uh, we know why it does. We don't train physicians and nurses how to have these difficult conversations. And if we do medical schools right now are doing spikes and they're doing a one hour lecture or one OSCE with or the simulated patient that's not even, that doesn't even seem real. Uh, so if, if, I, if you asked me to do an ears, nose and throat surgery, I'm going to be pretty damn nervous because I have no idea what I'm doing. And so I think that's what happens to most. But you said it's not that hard. (laughs) Okay. You got me on that one. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, anytime you ask somebody to do something that they don't feel comfortable doing, and in our surveys, we've we've trained over 10,000 doctors now, 90% of them, even the most senior physicians said that they were uncomfortable delivering bad news or having difficult conversations. And so if I'm nervous about something, I'm going to rush through it. It's going to show. Uh, And so one of the biggest, uh, so it's not unusual to be bad at it. And so one of my colleagues that I teach with, she says this all the time, before you go in the room, take your own pulse because it's, you're going to, your heart's going to be going fast and nobody wants to make anyone cry. Nobody wants to say anything sad. So the biggest mistake people make is that they don't come up with a plan and they, they're not prepared on how to say it. Once they understand that roadmap, they can sit back right before they go into that room, take a second. This is how I'm going to present my case. I always say, I want you to think of yourself as a lawyer doing a closing argument. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end to this. And so, and you may get thrown a curveball, but most of the time, the reaction that we get from the patient on the other side is largely due to how we presented it. So that's the biggest mistake uh, is is that they just uh, don't understand the right way of doing it. And so we rush through it. And then other mistakes we talked about, you know, trying to get out of the room quickly, not sitting down, not being aware of our own body language. That's a big one. I've spent 20 years learning body language and studying different nuances of four different kinds of smiles and, and what it means when your legs are crossed and what it means when your hands are like this. So please, if you're going to have a, a serious conversation with a patient, make sure that you're aware of your body language and you're paying attention to it and be aware of the other 70% of language is nonverbal, 20% is tone, inflection, and cadence, and only 10% is your words. So the words are are least important right here. So really understand and be aware of your body language. And then if you do that, the rest will just follow. What about silence? Great question. So uh, the the Rabbi Kushner, who wrote the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, seen lectures for him once. And in his book, he says one, he has a great quote that I use in my workshops. It says, say you're sorry and then shut up. And I love that quote because uh, when we're nervous, silence is really, really very, makes us even more nervous. So when you say something profound, like you have cancer, stop, say you're sorry, and then wait. And it's going to seem like an eternity I do an exercise with some of the doctors where I actually count. We, we videotape them doing these improvisational role-playing, and I'll say, how long do you think you, you kept quiet? And they'll say, oh, it must have been about 30 or 40 seconds. Try four. <laughs> so it seems really, but when you sit silently, you're saying without saying a word, I'm here, I'm not in a rush, and whatever you need, I'm very comfortable with this, and I'm here for you. Because... The three goals of breaking bad news is not, has nothing to do with information. It is one, that the patient thinks that you're a compassionate person, believes that you're a compassionate person. Two, that you're the expert in the room and they trust you. That's that whole trust and relationship and that you're going to lead them. I always say they're going to put their arms around your shoulders and you're going to lead them to the next step. And three is that you're not going to leave them. And by you sitting silently, that says all three of those things without saying a word. So you said, say you're sorry and then shut up. But what I hear from the lawyers is, don't say you're sorry because that's an admission of guilt. So that it seems like a, a balance there because even if, let's say you do have a complication, right? Let's say it's something that went wrong. Uh, If you're a surgeon, right? Uh, You're having a complication. I've heard what patients often, they just want to hear the doctor say they're sorry. 
But then the lawyers tell us, don't say you're sorry because then you're admitting that you did something wrong and that's it. That's the case. So if they ever decide to sue you, did you say you were sorry? Yeah. Why'd you say you're sorry? It's because you did something wrong. So how do we, I, I, I have never been able to, to work that out. What are we supposed to say? It's a great question. When you're giving tragic news like cancer, clearly it's not a medical error. When yeah. you, so you're saying you're sorry means, you know. And I'm sorry this here. is happening to you. Yes. Yes. Not, I'm now, sorry by the I way, this. Don't, don't say I'm sorry. I have to tell you this. Because when we, we do our interviews and we play things back to lay people, I'm sorry that I had to tell you this means, damn, after seven o'clock, I would have been off and the next doctor would have had to do this. You're trying so to I'm distance sorry. yourself from it. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Instead you have to hear it, this. You've got to own it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've seen patients go, you're sorry. You have to tell me, how do you think I feel having to hear it? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but saying you're sorry. And some people are so uncomfortable. I say, you're, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry. You have to hear this. Um, that's not an admission of guilt. As far as medical errors are concerned, we know that patients who've experienced medical errors deal with things much better, as you said, when the doctor says he's sorry, and they're actually less likely to sue. It's become so important that I, I, I don't, don't quote me on the exact number, but I, the last I checked, there, was, there were 16 states now that do not allow the words, I'm sorry, to be brought up in a malpractice lawsuit because they recognize how important it is for the doctor to say he's sorry, that it's not even admissible in court. 16 states. So not that's likely amazing. in New York. This is not a malpractice friendly <laughs> state for doctors. Well, I'm in Florida. It's even yeah. worse. So it's, oh, really? it's amazing. Yeah. So Florida, every other commercial is, you know, slip and fall and sue your doctor. And does your, did your child not do well in their SATs? So sue the OB and that kind of stuff. So, um, but so in, as far as medical errors, the, the advice still is to say that you're sorry because you're less likely going to get sued and that person will have a little bit more closure um, it's certainly a little tricky. I have found, because I also train some risk management people, I have found that hospitals are still doing the exact wrong things when it comes to revealing medical errors and they're taking their advice from the lawyers and all that's doing is, is making patients uh, more angry. When you walk into a room with a lawyer, a risk management, and the chief of the department, you're already in trouble. It's, you, know, you need to go in there yourself and you need to have that serious conversation, show compassion, say you're sorry, um, and you'll, you'd be surprised how much that helps. So that's not legal advice for everybody out there, but um, that's what I teach, and I truly do believe that. How do you end up modifying these conversations based on cultural backgrounds or education, right? Because you have to figure if you're talking to a fellow physician, it's going to be different than talking to someone with a middle school education. or you know, someone from the Northeast, like you and I, uh, versus someone from the other side of the planet, right? How do you end up compensating for the, the cultural differences and the educational differences? So the basic roadmap of program uh, really follows no, mat no, mat no matter what, who you're speaking to and what culture it is. You are, of course, going to modify because different cultures think of death and different cultures think of medicine very differently. And it's, it's, I think it's important for all doctors to understand cultural differences in healthcare, whether that be people from different countries or race or, or gender. So you do have to modify your words. And of course, education, we're going to have to use more simple words. But the planning position, the review, your body language, especially body language, uh, even children pick up on body language. So it, it, it's, that's universal. Forming that relationship and being there for the patient, the accountability, those things aren't going to change. You will change your, uh, your verbiage and you might speak a little bit differently. And of course, speaking to a doctor, you're going to use much more medical terms. Just as an aside, one of the things I can uh, just bring up to, to, to the doctors listening out there, when you give a diagnosis, no matter who the patient is, what their education is, after I say I had no carcinoma, what's the first thing the patient's doing? They're, they're, their eyes roll up in their head and they're going A, D. They're trying to figure out how to spell it. And they're saying, please don't forget it because I got to look this up as soon as I get home. So one of the things that I found in my teaching is tell them you have a specific form of cancer. So you're going to name it first. It is called this. I will write it down for you when you leave. 
And by doing that, it will snap their attention right back to you and you won't lose them. Otherwise, the next three sentences, they're still trying to remember it for Google. So in your field, in neonatology, uh, you know, those are some pretty sick kids. And I would imagine that you've had a lot of experience in breaking the bad news yourself. So how do you process all that grief? It's a great question. And, and even in neonatology or in oncology, doctors who do it all the time, many of them are still uncomfortable. Uh, I used to, in some of my older practices, there were some of my partners who just, despite being a neonatologist, didn't like to get bad news. And wow, this is great. We have Tony. This is what he does. He's the breaking bad news guy. I'll wait for him to come on and he'll tell them about the grade four intraventricular hemorrhage and whether they, some of them admitted it to me and say, yeah, I waited for you to come. And other ones I knew did it. <laughs> they didn't want to. Um, and so I ended up being the guy who's breaking the bad news all the time. And it used to bother me. At first it got me angry. Like, why is everybody making me do this? This is not fair. But Brad, once I started to really understand and see how much of a difference I can make in someone's life by doing it correctly and how I could help them both now and in th up to 30 years. Studies have shown that if you get this wrong, you could affect somebody for 30 years. Um, I started to take some pride in that. And that's what I teach the, the doctors that I speak to, that once you think of this as a skill, you'll go home and you'll be able to feel, even when the baby died, uh, even when someone just got a tragic diagnosis, you'll feel that you really helped. And you actually go home feeling uh, feeling fulfilled. Uh, I still get, I think it's up to 16 years now, I get Christmas cards from a, from a family that I pronounce their baby dead. Oh, God. Uh, that's, um, that makes me feel good. So, yeah, do I need to come home and have a glass of bourbon sometimes? Sure. <laughs> but overall, I think it's just how I look at it that even in the sadness, I was able to do something. And, and the, lecture, the, the keynote lecture that I give on Breaking Bad News is called Helping Families When They Need Us The Most. And so that's how I think about it. If you hadn't been there, they would have heard about it a lot differently. And so thank goodness you were the one doing it. So as hard as it is, you know, it's, there's fulfillment there. That's the way I feel. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying there's that I'm the only one that does it well because I have partners that are phenomenal at it. And there's our palliative care people. There's a lot of people that do it well, but there's a lot of people who just would rather not and are yeah. not good at it. So I, I feel like I come home and I did something uh, profound and something that really helped. You're from the Northeast. Yes. It's a mitzvah. <laughs> I guess in, in my, where I grew up in the, in the, where I raised my kids in North Caldwell, it was uh, um, half Italian, half Jewish. And uh, my son, uh, I remember my son went to 36 bar mitzvahs when he was 13 <laughs> years old. So, well, I'm on Long Island. It's uh, yeah, it's the same. So let's move on to something a little more fun. Let's move okay. on to the from the Orsini way, the technique to the Orsini way, the business. Because there are a lot of doctors out there with side gigs and looking, uh, you know, looking to do something outside of the exam room to uh, add some more fulfillment to their lives and maybe a little extra money in their pockets. Um, so let's talk about the business. How did you start the business? You said you started out as a 50, sorry, I don't know those numbers. Well, that sounds like, uh, oh. you know, political donations, I, you know, 503C well, or 501C3. 501C3, right. Uh, which means that? I was, yeah. I started out as a charity. I thought okay, 10 non years ago, yeah. nonprofit. And I said, you know, I'm going to put together this. We're going to get all these donations. We're going to use the money. It actually was called the BBN foundation. And, um, that worked great. And then I realized uh, that it just wasn't worth the, you know, the amount of scrutiny that 501c3s are subject to. Uh, and in fact, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I go with my my lawyer friend and we go to a Fifth Avenue lawyer to start the 501c3. And uh, he's sitting next to me and this lawyer walks into the room, at this big table in the room. And she says, um, she introduces herself and she said, I just want you to know that Everything you do from this point on, the IRS is going to assume you're laundering money. So <laughs> if you if you mess one thing up, you're going to go to jail. Now, do you still want to do this? <laughs> so, okay. so, so I had a board. They were great. After about three years, they lost some interest. I noticed that Lauren and I, my wife, were putting in most of the money. And so it just became a lot easier to shift it over to the LLC. And then I rebranded it as, as the Orsini way. 
I'm glad I did. I have a lot more freedom on what I want to do. Um, and it's become a side gig for me. Um, and uh, with the patient experience and the it's all in the delivery program that I use now to train a bunch of hospitals, including University of North Carolina um, and a bunch of other bigger hospitals, um, it's been very, very busy. And then, of course, there's the podcast that's helped me do that. That's just for fun. If there was one thing you were going to do differently about the business, and since you already mentioned the the charitable aspect of it, <laughs> we'll, we, we, won't, we won't let you use that again. But one thing that you would do differently about building and growing and maybe even marketing your business, what would you have done differently? Um, I made a lot of mistakes, Brad, because doctors, as you know, we're not businessmen. And I listened to uh, a bunch of people who said I needed this and I needed that. And you need to you need to have this spectacular website and you need to do SEO and you need to do all that. And I listened to a lot of people who gave me some bad advice when I realized in the end that the program and myself were the brand. I'm the product. People are asking for me to give lectures and to train their doctors because of the reputation that I built. And nobody's Googling, you know, who can teach me how to break bad news. And so um, I think that those mistakes had to be made. Um, I lost a lot of money doing it. Um, But I think the biggest, I would say my advice to anyone out there is start off slow, stop listening to a bunch of people who are looking just to make themselves money. And you, I found myself for years working just to put money in the people, working just to pay the bills for people that I didn't need in the first place. And so now I have one person who works with me, uh, Elizabeth Christ, and she's um, she's been instructing with me. She's a lay person uh, and she's dedicated. And, uh, you know, we have a great website and do other things, but I don't have all these people with their hands in my pocket. I, I read a book on, I sur- so I surf, I, well, I used to, and now I can't get out so much because my kids are young. I, have to, um, I, can't, I can't leave for a few hours. And I read a book on surfing, and one thing that it said was, let your surfing do the talking. Like, nobody is out there. Nobody's paddling out to talk to you. So don't start paddling up to people and chatting with them and chatting with them. Just shut up and let your surfing do the talking. So it sounds like it's the same thing with you. Let your brand do the talking. You're the brand. All this noise with search engine optimization and Facebook ads and Google ads, ultimately it's it's the word of mouth. People, someone took your class, someone took your webinar, someone uh, heard you keynote speak, and they're going to tell someone about it, and they're going to tell someone about it, and then it just grows uh, organically rather than spending all this money so that ra- you show up on random people's Google searches that aren't even looking for your product because, you know, that's, that's not what they were searching to begin with. And you just happen to have more SEO. It's hundred percent right. I wish I had had that advice early on, you know, most, when I looked at, so I'm spending all this money on SEO, I'm spending all this money on redoing the website. And then I looked at who were my clients, who were the people that were, were calling me invariably 80 to 90% of the time. It was, I heard you speak at that conference can you come and do a program at our hospital or a resident that just became an attending physician here uh, tells me that, you know, you do this, it's all in the delivery program, or you did this great patient satisfaction program at this hospital. Can you come here? Uh, And uh, I would have saved myself a lot of money, but, um, but now I finally, you know, it takes time, but you learn, learn from your mistakes. Great. So where can people find you? Where can people find your podcast? And um, if they want to get you to speak or get you to, you know, teach teach them the Orsini way, how can they go about doing that? Uh, the best way to get in touch with me is to go to my website, theorsiniway.com. Um, if my email address is drorsini, Dr. Orsini at theorsiniway.com. But you can just go to the website and um, and hit the contact us list and, and I'll get back to you very quickly. Uh, the podcast has been doing great. It's called Difficult Conversations-Lessons I've Learned as an ICU Physician. And I hope you'll come on as a guest also. Uh, I think, and we explore uh, how conversations and how communication affects us both in our professional and our private lives. And the book, It's All in a Delivery, which covers everything that we talked about today with Breaking Bad News, but also uh, the five principles of uh, improving patient experience that's available on Amazon and on my website. Dr. Anthony Orsini of the Orsini Way, thanks so much for your time. Brad, thank you. It was an absolute honor and a lot of fun, and I hope to have you on my podcast soon. Definitely. All right. 
Such a great show with Dr. Orsini. But before we end, don't forget to reach out to MR Insurance Consultants, where their goal is to assist physicians in obtaining the most comprehensive coverage available to fit their unique situation. Reach out for both excellent and quality service at drpodcastnetwork.com slash mrinsurance. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.